Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm going to get us started. Welcome to our webinar, uh, Preserving the Archaeological Wonders of Honduras and Nepal. Uh, my name is Umar Harmansha. I'm the Vice President for Cultural Heritage uh, on the Governing Board of the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, and I'm also serving as uh, director of the School of Art and Art History um, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, in this webinar, we intend to take you to two fabulous countries with extraordinary archaeological remains and a wealth of cultural heritage. Um, and um, our webinar is intended to highlight the ongoing archaeological work in the state of cultural heritage preservation in the countries uh, of the Republic of Honduras in Central America and the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal in South Asia. Uh, and I'm, we have two wonderful speakers, uh, two wonderful guests today to tell you about Honduras and Nepal, um, respectively, Prof Professor Rosemary Joyce and Professor Mark Altendorfer, who um, will be presenting us their um, own work and um, their view of the archaeological remains in these two, uh, two countries. So um, before we hear from each of them, um, I have a few things to sort of really give us some context about this uh, webinar, um, and then I will introduce our speakers. Um, uh, after we hear from them, um, I also have a few words um, about um, about writing letters to support um, the cases for um, Honduras and uh, Nepal. So we're organizing this um, this webinar primarily on the occasion of the upcoming consideration of cultural property and anti-trafficking agreements with these two countries by the U.S. Cultural Property Advisory Board to encourage our members and the public to be informed about supporting the signing of these um, agreements by writing letters. Um, so towards the end of our webinar, I will walk you through um, uh, a few steps on how to write a strong letter for this uh, for this purpose. So the U.S. Cultural Property Advisory Committee makes recommendations to the president about bilateral cultural property agreements between the U.S. and nations seeking to uh, protect their archaeological objects from looting and illegal export. Before recommending those bilateral agreements to be signed or renewed, CPAC reviews written testimony from constituents to determine whether countries um, are doing, these countries are doing their part to protect the, their archaeological heritage and participate in cultural exchange. In their upcoming meeting um, on September 19th and 20, 2023, um, CPAC will solicit public testimony on the state of cultural heritage preservation um, in these two countries in Honduras and Nepal um, in order to consider the renewal of the agreement with Honduras and a new agreement um, with Nepal. So I'm really excited to let you know that for the first time, CPAC is actually holding these meetings outside of their home um, in Washington, DC, and they will be visiting my university, University of Illinois at Chicago campus, and we'll be hosting them. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really um, excited to welcome them um, to our campus. But AIA is um, spearheading a letter writing campaign uh, to support these agreements. Um, you can really make a big difference by contributing with a letter. I hope you will consider this after our webinar today. If you have been to one of one or both of these countries um, before uh, and visited archaeological sites, um, uh, feel free to share with us um, on the chat. Um, I know we asked you when you were registering um, this as well. Um, but also um, feel free to post questions to our speakers as well. Um, at the end of this webinar, we'll have some time um, 
to um, to turn to your questions and ask um, uh, Mark and Rosemary to address them. In any case, I'm very excited to present to you our two distinguished guests today um, who will present to you their ongoing work in Honduras and Nepal, respectively. Um, our first guest is uh, Professor Rosemary Joyce. I'm super excited to meet her and introduce her in this occasion. I've been a great admirer of her work all the time. And so um, she's Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. And she has served on as an AIA lecturer for many years. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, she has also experience of serving on the cultural um, uh, property Advisory Committee in the past for several years. Um, she has that experience. She received her degrees from Cornell University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, who's my neighbor. Um, and she specializes in the archaeology of Mesoamerica. I'm sure, as many of you know, Mesoamerica and Central America, uh, focusing on materiality and the archaeology of inequality, gender, sex, and sexuality, and cultural heritage policy. Her current research projects um, include uh, quote, urban life at Palenque, Chiapas, um, supported by an NEH grant. Um, and a medieval Honduran alchemy uh, as well. So um, her most recent book is A Past for Nuclear Waste, Archaeology, Archetypes, and Art, which was published by Oxford University Press. Um, and Professor Joyce has received numerous awards and honors for her work. I'm so excited to welcome her um, today. Um, let me introduce Mark as well, and then I'll, I'll pass the microphone to Rosemary. Um, our second guest is uh, Professor Mark Alden-Durfer, uh, Distinguished Professor of Emeritus and holds um, the Edward A. Dixon Emeriti Professorship and Dow Chair in the Department of Anthropology and Heritage Studies at the University of California, Merced. Um, he is also Adjunct Professor with the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona, Thompson, and um, his research focuses on comparative analysis of high altitude cultural and biological adaptations from an archaeological perspective. And he's likely to be the only archaeologist who has done research on the three high elevation plateaus of the planet, Ethiopian, Andean, and Tibetan. Um, over the course of his career. With this occasion, I'm just so excited to get to know about her work and his work and meet him as, um, as well. So um, he currently works in the high Himalayas of Nepal, studying pre-Buddhist and Buddhist era sites. He holds his degrees from Pennsylvania State University, um, PhD and uh, Wake Forest University. He has conducted fieldwork in Tibet Nepal, Peru, Argentina, Ethiopia, and at sites throughout the United States. And um, Professor um, Alden Rufer was also AI's Norton lecturer for 2013-14. So I'm very excited to, um, to present him um, today as well. Mark, thank you so much for, uh, for being our guest. So um, with that, I'd love to pass the microphone to Rosemary to for her to tell us about um, her ongoing archaeological work and the state of cultural heritage preservation in Honduras. Um, Rosemary, the floor is yours. Thank you. OK. Um, thank you very much. And I want to thank the AIA for this opportunity to talk in general about Honduran cultural heritage, um, which is um, something that is perhaps lesser known than other areas of the Americas, but is uh, prominent in many museum collections, often labeled as classic Maya. And one of the things I want to do today is give you a sense of the long term 3000 years of pre-Columbian cultural heritage that we understand, we know about in Honduras through the work of archaeologists and that is being preserved better today as a result of the Memorandum of Understanding with the United States. Um, for those of you who don't know, Honduras is one of the largest countries in landmass in Central America. It borders Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. Um, for many people, 
Honduras is known because of the World Heritage Site, UNESCO World Heritage Site, Copan, with its important historical monuments carved in stone. And as you can see on this map from the Atlas of Ancient Maya Sites, Copan exists just across the Honduran border from Guatemala. Uh, Copan, as a major Maya site, has an urban core that is uh, densely built up with ball courts and monumental architecture. Copan has been protected by the Honduran government since at least the turn of the 20th century. And as a result, it is in, um, in large part protected from the impacts of uh, looting and depredation of its remains. The same can't be said for the rest of the country. And this map shows you a, um, an overview of parts of the country where there has been systematic archaeological work. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that most of the country has not seen that. The center and eastern part of the country still is largely uh, difficult of access because it is tropical forests or inland tropical savannas. And most of the work that I have done has been in the areas along the Caribbean coast, the, um, from the Valley of Naco to the Catuana and Oloman Valleys. In most of the country, there is nothing as large and built up as Copan. The largest sites instead look like this site, Cruste, um, which, well, um, having a core of possibly 75 earthen structures with cobble facing is a much smaller kind of archaeological site. And very, very few of these sites have been preserved, especially as um, economic modernization has required the country to convert what once was agricultural land into um, various forms of small factories serving international monuments, ma uh, markets, things like things called maquilas in the literature. Um, archaeologists did explore many of these sites before they were destroyed. For example, Travasia seen here, um, today largely destroyed, uh, but was explored from the 1890s through the 20th century, producing a record that's more typical of archaeological uh, heritage in Honduras. There is stone sculpture, but stone sculpture is not the primary artistic medium and not the primary thing that the heritage, um, form of heritage that is used by archaeologists to reconstruct history or of interest to collectors. Instead, it's the ceramic arts that really dominate the heritage trade and the traffic in antiquities from Honduras. And much of those materials actually come from much, much smaller sites, sites that we can visualize like this very small hamlet. Now, this is one of the distinctive things about most of Honduras, which is that works of great artistic beauty were actually made and used in the smallest hamlets throughout the country. They were not just held by the rulers or a noble class. Much of the country actually saw a greater participation. And so what we're looking at then is very low structures where the remains of buildings may be limited to one line of stones in agricultural fields where as agriculture goes on, people can encounter beautiful objects. And so there's a long history of farmers for subsistence reasons encountering these things and when approached by the intermediaries in the international traffic and antiquities, turning them over for what really is a very small amount of money before they enter in that market. In recent years as well, in this region, we have begun to see some small um, finds being sold directly over the internet through Facebook groups, through eBay, and through other means. And so it is not just monumental sculptures or great works of art that are leaving this country, but actually things that are the are affecting our understanding of everyday life. Um, and our understanding of everyday life comes from the excavation of these small sites, which give us the stone tools and the ceramics used for everything from meals to ceremonies um, that knit the society together. Now, I want to take you very rapidly 
through some of the materials from um, starting in the formative period and going through, and with an emphasis on two things. One, there are very few sites that are actually places you can visit in Honduras today. Los Naranjos and Yaromela are actually sites that are managed by the Institute of Anthropology and History and where you can visit as, an out, as a tourist. Um, and these sites are sites with very early remains. Both Yaromela and Los Naranjos have monumental earthen structures, pyramids, up to 100 meters on a side and up to 20 meters tall. These uh, pyramids sometimes have stone features included as well. And they were sites of three-dimensional monumental stone sculpture in what's called the Olmec style, the earliest major art style of Mesoamerica. These are sites as well that produce portable objects that were placed in burials and that can enter into the international antiquities market, like these ceramic ve vessels professionally excavated and now in the Honduran collections from Copan's early village, or these many uh, stamps and seals for which there is an international antiquities market. And even though these don't sell for large amounts of money, their extraction is very destructive because it, it involves destroying the household settings that tell us about social life going back to before 1500 BC. Some of the earliest villages in Central America have been investigated in Honduras. Um, many of these works are, as I've said, works of great beauty. And so they appeal to international collectors in the art market. Um, many museums in the US that hold these things don't exhibit them. So you're not going to see them unless you visit the museums in Honduras, in San Pedro Sula, the Mu Museum of San Pedro Sula, or Comayagua, the Museum of Comayagua, where you can see works like this. Um, so what we have then is from between 1500 and 400 BC, we already have great artistry in ceramics and in, in fired clay. And these works are prized in uh, by collectors, for example, of these very vivid and realistic uh, ceramic figurines. Um, regrettably, one part of this early record is almost entirely known only from the works that ended up in private collections. And this is the, the three-dimensional stone sculptures that are made of greenstone which tell us again about Honduras's relationship to the Olmec civilization of the Gulf Coast of Mexico. This is an unusual piece in that it was reported to the Institute in 2006 when it was found by local people. And part of the reason local people start reporting these things is because the Honduran Institute of Anthropology and local museums have begun to create a, a kind of culture of public accountability and ownership and interest in them. Um, these Olmec pieces are highly uh, negotiable or are of great interest in the international art market, but they're also of great interest for us to understand the histories of circulation of people in the very distant past in this region, the economies and religious relationships. Most of the things, though, that end up uh, as the heritage of the country come from the classic period, and here, um, Copan, again, as I said, is very much not, it's the minority. It's that pink area here with the Lua polychromes that produces most of the things that end up in the art market. The ceramics of Copan, while beautiful in my view, are not as interesting to international collectors as Alua polychromes, which are my specialization, because Alua polychromes are seen as comparable to classic Maya polychromes. Alua polychromes were made for hundreds of years in very slightly different formats with vivid animal um, depictions being part of this, but especially prized by the international uh, art market are these pieces that have ceremonial scenes painted uh, around the vase. So in this Alua region, in addition to the pottery uh, vessels, there's also a um, important uh, ceramic sculptural tradition, both in small scale, this is hand handheld musical instruments like the figurine on the left, 
made from molds, which we find in those archaeological sites, but also monumental scale, close to life scale, human depictions in clay among some of the most um, dramatic pieces of art that we know of from Central America. And of course, the probably the most prized and highest valued objects from Honduras on the art market are Alua marble vases, which are made from marble that is from quarries in the Alua Valley. Um, uh, the work of Christina Luke um, identified the patterns of exchange that bring these into Guatemala and all the way south to Costa Rica. And these have been found in association as well with other unusual pieces like this copper and gold alloy um, uh, sculpture and jades. So all of those materials are small scale and easily transportable. And these are the things that are found throughout the country and in greatest danger from, um, from the possibility of looting. But the, the damage doesn't end with the classic period and its fluorescence of artworks. We also find in the post-classic period, beginning with the period from 950 to uh, 1050 BC, at another site you could actually visit, Tenampua in Comayagua, um, we see the continuation of polychrome painting and its transformation into new forms with white slip um, that present us with new themes again because they show humans in interaction of great interest to international collectors and these appear in conjunction with three-dimensional stone sculptures used as seats of power by people in Honduras in this period between about 900 and 1200 um, AD. These are pieces which again have been found in archaeological excavations in Honduras but far many more of them are found in museums today as a result of informal excavation and trafficking outside the country. And finally, even those work, those sites that were occupied when the Spanish first came to the country have produced works of interest to collectors and to museums. These are pieces that uh, continue to be found. New forms of cultural heritage are uncovered every decade most recently in far eastern Honduras, the rediscovery of sites with these enormous um, carved stone vases, all of which are in danger because their beauty attracts an international market and a country with the, um, with the challenges that Honduras has from drug trafficking, drought, and poverty, uh, while it is doing its very best to elevate public consciousness cannot protect the many hundreds, if not thousands of archeological sites involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. This was so informative and, and, and really, really interesting. Thank you so much. I learned, I learned quite a bit um, there. Um, so I'd like to pass the microphone to Mark um, to, uh, for him to tell us about the cultural heritage um, in Nepal. So Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hold on hmm. one second, please. Very good. So this presentation that I'm going to offer is a, a bit different and the reasons will become fairly clear as I go through um, my the images that I've chosen to share with you today. Uh, one thing that I will stress right at the beginning is that unlike the archeology span on Honduras, uh, the archaeology of Nepal is very, very poorly understood in Nepal, as well as almost everywhere else in the world. And so we have to think about the context then of what I'm about to talk about. It will be more about um, times that we would consider to be relatively recent, as opposed to those in the distant past. So I want to show you first simply where we are in the world. Uh, I imagine that some of you on the webinar today have been to Nepal. 
Um, it's a it's a lovely tourist destination. It has extraordinary cultural heritage that I will briefly talk about in terms of the built environment. But I just want to show you where we are, because to me, this is the most fascinating aspect of Nepal in one sense is, is that it's on the it's, it's this boundary between South Asia, the Tibetan plateau. It looks like it's actually quite forbidding in terms of crossing, but in fact, actually, uh, the, the Himalayas serve as a corridor as well as a barrier to cultural interactions that take place between uh, Tibet, Central Asia, further beyond, even into Siberia, as well down into South Asia, Sri Lanka, even all, as far uh, west as Africa. We find art artifacts and objects in some of the archaeological collections that have been found in Nepal over the last 20 to 30 years. If you like to see a political map then of the country, you can see then that the elevation as we move to the Tibetan plateau uh, go quite steeply up in, into uh, the altitude. Uh, down at the lower end where you see the green is the strip of land that is called the Terai. And I'll have mentioned to talk about the Terai a number of times during this conversation today. Uh, Note as Kathmandu is the capital of the country. And there are various, you know, it's broken into now a variety of different provinces, each of which has its own local governments. Uh, that's a, quite a bit of a change from, from the way in which uh, Nepal was governed until relatively recently within the 20th century. Um, I'm not going to go through much of the archaeology. As I said earlier, it's not very well known. Um, there is Paleolithic occupation along the southern border of Nepal with India. Um, there are Neolithic sites occasionally scattered throughout the country. Um, the Himalayas are known to have been occupied by projects like mine as early as about 3,000 years ago. But frankly, when we really look at the details of the archaeological record, it's extraordinarily sparse. And so it's important to keep that in mind as I work through some of my conversation with you today. So we do have, though, extraordinary UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Nepal. So what you're looking at right now is uh, Durbar Square in Patan province. Uh, in fact, the Kathmandu Valley uh, is the location of one of the major concentrations of UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the country. There are seven different sets of monuments that are found here, and you can see the extraordinary complexity of these. These date to relatively late times. That is, they're probably you know not a whole lot earlier than the 15th, uh, 14th, 15th centuries. And so we're relatively late in history at this point. Um, some of you may have been to Patan. Some of you may have been to this site as well. This is Bodhnath, a major uh, Buddhist temple uh, shrine in the center of the Kathmandu Valley itself. There are other sites that are on the tentative list for uh, UNESCO World Heritage. That is, there are um, four that are listed right now that are uh, the Kathmandu Valley, um, one more that I'm blanking out on right now. Oh, Lumbini, we'll be getting there in just a moment. And then there are 15 or so that are listed on the tentative list, but have not moved forward since about 2008. So there's a there's a bit of a gap in terms of creating additional world heritage sites within the country. This is Lumbini. Um, it's thought to be the birthplace of the historical Buddha. There are, of course, questions about that. What you're looking at in this image is the Maya Devi temple that surrounds the, the, the place that is reputed to be the birthplace of the historical Buddha, which would go back, uh, depending on whose history you want to believe, anytime around, oh, let's say, 550 BC or so, BCE, give or take. Um, a recent set of excavations by uh, archaeologists from the University of Durham, Robin Cunningham in particular, they've been the ones who have made this argument that what you're looking at in this very complex interior of the Maya Devi Temple is in fact um, indicative of a tree, crine, a tree shrine or a tree cult that was once very commonly observed in this part of the world, and that there are indications that are suggestive that this may have been one of the earliest tree shrines, uh, tree cult in the this part of uh, Nepal as well as in northern India. Uh, of course, some people you know have questions about whether or not this actually relates to the birth of the Buddha or not. 
doesn't matter in one sense, because this is what the country has decided. This is what it is. Uh, there's controversy with India at some point as well, who claims some aspects of Indian prehistory are more likely to be the birthplace of the Buddha. But we'll just leave that at the at this moment and say, yes, this is likely to be a very early, early Buddhist shrine in this region. There's a very large number of uh, Buddhist era sites that are in the Terai. Recall that green strip that I showed you in my uh, geography lesson that I offered earlier. So the you can see some of the reconstruction that's been taking place here. Many of these sites were first discovered and then excavated back in the late 19th and then early 20th century, uh, by primarily by British, to some extent, other European um, archaeologists. Um, you can see that they've been reconstructed at least to a point. And so many of these sites are actually um, easy to go visit on a tourist circuit that includes Umbini and then a variety of other um, Buddhist sites in this region. But there are other places as well that have seen some archaeological work, and this is where I work now in Upper Mustang. So Mustang is basically a little thumb of land that goes from the South Asian area into the Tibetan plateau. And what you're looking at are these things called the, the sky caves of Mustang. And, you know, people like to write about these as being weird and mysterious and strange and you know, all of these adjectives that go along with the discovery. But really what you're looking at is an apartment complex that was built sometime back in the, oh, the 12th or 13th century CE and was occupied by various groups of people over time. Um, we've had the opportunity to actually begin working in some of these since about 2008. And I'll show you a few slides from this area as well. Um, this is how you get into some of these places. Uh, it's not any fun. This is not my idea of a fun kind of archaeology because I have to rope into all these places. I have to work in very uncomfortable circumstances. And I trust the gentleman that you see hanging from ropes to get me in and out of these places alive. But but it's worth the effort because there are extraordinary things to be found in these caves, one of which in this particular instance is the first gold and silver mask ever found in uh, Nepal. It's interesting that these then are also found in Western Tibet and also stretch into Central Asia as well, uh, uh, even to as far west as what would be now modern Iran. Um, these are mortuary. There are These are mortuary caves, at least the ones we're working in at the moment, but there are a whole range of them, ranging from these apartment complexes to monastic cells of Buddhist monks that might have inhabited the region to these mortuary sites as well. But let me turn now to one of the dark problems of what we know about the Nepali past, and that is, it is, it is, I wouldn't say significantly looted. And I'll tell you why I think that's the question, uh, the, the reason, there are reasons for that in a moment. What you're looking at here, though, is one of the mortuary caves that is found in Upper Mustang. It is a chorten, that is the object you see on the, the left of this image, is a basically a mortuary uh, facility for a high-ranking lama or some other high-ranking religious figure. It's cracked open, as you see right there, because there are remains of either the lama himself or mm -hmm. objects that were personal to that individual's life. You can see our archaeological colleagues sitting over in the corner taking notes on this. So this is one of the more dramatic images that I know of uh, in my own work in the region that shows a very direct, you know, looting for objects that could in fact be valuable on the international art market. But other sites have looting as well, but it's much more subtle. What you're looking at now is a site called Marzong, which is a another cave and complex in Upper Mustang. And you can see that there are a number of, uh, of potential habitations in the site. Um, you can take a look then at the interior of it. This is simply just the lowest level. There are seven other levels above it in this particular instance. You know, the degree to which this is collapsed, this is degree to which it has been modified by people is somewhat unclear to us. That is, we think it's a, a series of processes that do this, but, but most of the destruction that's been wrought on this is done by nature primarily, not by human agency. 
but there are some instances where in fact it is. And so one of the things that we discovered in this project in the upper floors of this site of Marzong were some tens of thousands of Tibetan script folios that were written at different times ranging back from oh, about the 12th century to relatively recent times. They were stored in a room high up in this complex. And as you can see, there's a beautiful illustration in the center of this. And what we discovered, though, as we continued looking through these, is that some of these illustrations were very nicely cut out of these manuscript folios. Now, local story tells us that what happened to this particular image, as well as the others, is that they all ended up in the uh, someone's uh, office in a major Swiss corporation in Switzerland. So we know that then local people were going into this cave, um, extracting certain parts of it, that is extracting the folios and very carefully cutting these out. These end up on the international art market. So, but but this is this is relatively uncommon, at least in my experience. Most of the other looting that I have seen in Nepal uh, during the work that I've conducted is is relatively small scale. Um, it's a trench here, a pit there. It's un very much unlike what Rosemary talked about in terms of the kind of more massive uh, excavations in sites across Honduras. It's a very local affair in this instance. Other sites, though, find themselves to be destroyed. That is, uh, follow my cursor, you can see where it's circling right here. This is one of the few systematic excavations that actually took place in Mustang back in the 1990s, a place called Kinga Mound. Uh, it was you know, relatively early in date, has a very long occupational sequence. Uh, the time I got to visit it, though, it had already been bulldozed by local folks uh, getting ready to build a health clinic, an old folks home, uh, something that never actually happened. And so my point here is, is that, yes, their archaeological sites have been damaged by looting and by, but mostly by sheer inattention in this country, simply because the authorities that we have in country really do not have the resources to deal with this effectively. So who is responsible then for managing archaeological sites in the country? Well, by law and by statute uh, that was passed back in 1956, uh, the Department of Archaeology has a domain over these archaeological sites. They have domain over the museums of the country, the public museums. They have right over the, the heritage preservation activities. They have an incredible mission statement. And sadly, they're extraordinarily underfunded. That is the very significant problem that we find in Nepal, is that despite a very strong desire for, for heritage preservation to be manifest in the country, the ability of the nation is simply extraordinarily limited in terms of its the possibilities of taking care of that heritage in an effective way. This is one of the reasons I'm very strongly supporting the initiation of this agreement, the bilateral agreement with the United States and Nepal, because this will provide, I hope, a means by which we can strengthen the activities, maybe even increase the budget someday of the actual Department of Archaeology to serve these ends. But really where the what I would call the, the art action lies in Nepal is not so much with archaeological sites. That is, you may find objects like this in an archaeological site, but because they're really relatively unknown by both archaeologists as well as local people, you know, they're not found in archaeological contexts per se. So what we're looking at here then is the extraordinary art market for Nepali bronzes, um, wooden objects, a variety of things taken out of temple contexts uh, across the country. So let me give you a sense of where these things are. And let me also give you an idea about what kind of context I want you to think about these in, because it's not simply here's an object, but uh, it's also about what do these objects serve? How do these things work in Nepali society? So here's one example of a fairly formal place in which you would find objects like this. This is the it Itumbaha Monastery in Kathmandu. And if you look around the surrounding here for a moment, you'll see a variety of different statues and statuary of one sort or another. Uh, much of it is relatively early, meaning it's sometime the 15th, 16th centuries or later. But you can see also that it appears to be protected in one sense. No, it's it looks like it's being preserved. Very clean, very, you know, very you know, uh, precisely laid out environment. 
But you can also go to other parts of uh, Nepal and find situations like this. This is a Tibetan monastery called Ludigompa in Upper Mustang. And you can see the precarious nature of the, of the construction of the building. But inside are extraordinary works of Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist art in particular. Now, what's, what is being preserved here? Well, there's only a very, there's a caretaker that shows up every so often and sees whether or not the door has been opened or un uh, unlocked. It is a tourist site that's difficult to get into, but yet anyone literally can walk into that and see what happens to be there. One more example. Oh, two more examples. Sorry. This is what you see in, in many street locations in towns and cities and villages across Nepal. People living here believe they're, they're artifacts, these religious artifacts that you're looking at right here. They call these things a, a living museum. They call it an open museum because this is an active zone of worship for the people that live in the neighborhood. So people will come and do their, their whatever the rite happens to be for that particular day or moment in time, leave the uh, offerings here and then move on. And you can see then that there's a variety of statues here, some of which are quite old, some of which aren't. But my point is that the, the context of that art that collectors so covet in the Western and some of the Asian countries of the world is really found in contexts of living people and their lives on the daily basis. But even still, and I apologize for the quality of the image, but I wanted to show you a private house in basically a very isolated part of Mustan in Nepal, where there are artifacts of all different kinds that are of great desire for art collectors across the world. And so are these protected? Only in a sense they're protected by the inhabitants of the house. So in fact, recently then in some of the more remote areas along the border with Tibet, there's been a number of very recent thefts of objects taken out of private homes, as well as monastic and other temple institutions. So the, the heyday of art collecting in one sense in Nepal was during the uh, late 60s through the 80s. It's diminished to some extent, but hardly disappeared, especially now that it's going into much more remote areas that are much more difficult to protect. Let me give you another example just of recent things and to give you a sense of how this is now being challenged by, by, by individuals and organizations. So I'm taking to, 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 uh, to Luju Temple in Kathmandu. And if you see my cursor circling around, that's a major doorway to get into this complex. And I wanna bring you there now in this image. So if you take a look then at the upper right, you see the doorway that was once original. That is, that was what this doorway looked like in photographs that were taken in the, I believe in the 1970s. And so on the upper left-hand side, you can see a close-up of the original right there. And notice then just below that is after theft. Well, the doorway itself wasn't taken, that entire, com that entire construction wasn't taken, but the, all of these little statues that you see here in the middle, one, two, three, four, five, they were literally pried off of the object, that is of the doorway, and they all ended up, well, where do you think? They ended up at Bonham's auction house in New York City. And they were only recognized as theft at some point by people who have been now monitoring the situation. And some of these, in fact, then these were restored. And one of the most important ways in which they were restored is this organization called the Lost Arts of Nepal. It's a Facebook page. You can go there. You can take a look at what's on that page and their extraordinary. There are a lot of photography of different objects that people say, well, we believe these objects were once in this particular location in Nepal, and now we see them somewhere. We see them in a Western museum. We see them in a private collection. We see them in some other context. So this has been a citizen's movement, not a governmental agency that's actually taking this on. The Department of Archaeology will cooperate and will work effectively with folks if, in fact, it can be very clearly documented that the object in question has, in fact, been stolen and it has been taken from a particular location that can be uh, clearly observed.
just an example of some of these things that have popped up recently and then been returned back to Nepal through the agency of the uh, Lost Arts of Nepal, as well as the National Heritage Recovery Center, yet another private organization that's doing this work. This is a lovely piece of wood that's come out of that Itumba Baha uh, Monastery. It was in the Rubin Museum until very recently. Another object as well, Napsara, again, from that same site. If you go to that website, then you will see images like this. You will see back and forth in terms of, well, here's something we think is in a pot, was in Patan at some point, picture taken. On the right-hand side, you see it looks like the same object is found in the Metropolitan Museum. So there are some people have estimated that 80% of the objects on display in museums across the world from Nepal are actually from looted contexts that is from the illicit art market. Some people contest that. These are the citizen activists that have been doing this. That is, they work with the government. The government will work with them if documentation is clear. And so you can read about this in the New York Times as well as the, there's a strong momentum now to begin to ask for repatriation of these objects. But of course, you can imagine the, the I would say, the, the resistance that many museums do in fact offer to this entire process. So in conclusion, looking at a beautiful Himalayan landscape, I want to stress the importance of this bilateral agreement. What I think it will do ultimately will be to strengthen the ability, ultimately, not immediately, of the Department of Archaeology to in fact be able to preserve its heritage more effectively by, you know, creating a more formal channel by which repatriation can take place, by which artifacts can be in fact uh, taken back to the country and then you know stored or put back into, literally put back into the living museums, open museum of people's lives in the streets of Nepal. And so with that, I'm finished. Thank you very much for your attention and joining me today. I hope you all decide to write letters because it's a really important thing to be doing right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was fabulous. That was just really spectacular. Thank you so much. I love those um, landscapes and caves of Upper Mustang, and you brought us all the way to this sort of um, activism towards repatriation. That's just so wonderful. Thank you so much for that, for that phenomenal um, overview for us. Um, so, um, Fabulous. Now that we heard from both um, Rosemary and Mark about Honduras and Nepal, um, I hope you, uh, our, 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 um, uh, our audience can put together, as you're putting together your questions for our speakers, I want to take a few minutes um, from these breathtaking landscapes of Honduras, actually moving from Honduras to Nepal. I, I want to take a few seconds to walk you a little bit, you know, give you a quick guide about how to craft a powerful letter um, for the Cultural Property Advisory Board to support uh, these cultural property agreements um, um, as um, this is a perfect transition from what how Mark concluded um, his presentation. So thank you for that, Mark. So um, let me just um, share my screen here um, real quick. Um, and, all right. Um, yeah, how do we, how do we, um, how do we craft a strong letter um, uh, to the Cultural Property Advisory Board for their consideration? and in support of the cultural heritage preservation in these countries. Um, please remember that these um, cultural property agreements help prevent the destruction of archaeological sites in these countries, but they also have a major impact um, in reducing the looting of archaeological sites, while agreements also mandate bilateral exchange of archaeological ex exhibitions, traveling exhibitions, cultural exchange, more scientific collaborations. Um, that's why we want to emphasize 
the importance of writing letters and supporting um, supporting these um, um, agreements. Um, even if you've never visited either of these countries in person, perhaps you've been captivated by their cultural heritage through courses that you've taken, you've presentations um, that you've seen, like um, those fabulous ones offered by Rosemary and Mark today, or museum exhibits that you've seen in the US or elsewhere, right? Your connection to the archeological heritage of Honduras and Nepal makes you, um, even your curiosity makes you an ideal advocate for preserving those countries past. And this is precisely a very rare occasion. I can't highlight it more. It's a very rare occasion and opportunity where you can make a real difference um, by spending an hour or so to draft a letter and to send it. And if you're a major lover or advocate of archaeology in our history of Nepal and Honduras. So the President's um, Cultural Property Advisory Board Committee um, is the American body empowered to make recommendations under the 1983 Convention on Cult Cultural Property Implementation Act, um, which is how the U.S. fulfills the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import export and transfer of ownership of cultural property. The principal means of accomplishing this in the United States is through a five-year bilateral agreements between the US and other countries. Before these agreements are signed or renewed, um, the committee, CPAC, reviews written testimony from the public to determine whether countries are doing their part to protect the cultural heritage and participate in cultural exchange. So this is where you come in. Um, join us in our letter writing campaign, please. We don't have much time and public testimony for the upcoming meeting to review and consider US agreements with Honduras and Nepal is due on September 12th at midnight Eastern Daylight Time. I'd like to walk you through some easy steps and effective strategies. What do you say in this letter, right? What is it more effective um, to, um, and important aspects of your relationship to these countries um, from the perspective of the uh, Cultural Property Advisory Committee? We recommend, um, AIA recommends a three-step approach. Step one is to introduce yourself and talk about your connection to Honduras or Nepal. Um, and CPAC really values the personal connections and real experiences of archaeological sites and museums, particularly if you have been to them. Um, and sharing your firsthand experience um, um, would probably have the greatest impact on the committee's deliberations. Perhaps you were on a tour across one of these countries, um, for example, since 2003, AIA Tours has operated about 23 trips that included Honduras um, on its itinerary, um, with the participation of uh, 243 travelers alongside with AIA lecturers and local guides. Hopefully you participated in one of these fantastic journeys, or perhaps you participated in an archeological excavation or survey project, or simply saw an exhibition featuring artifacts from Honduras or Nepal. Possibly you went to a very inspiring presentation like today. Um, and all of these connections are worthwhile to highlight in your letter. So the committee would be interested also to hear if any way you feel that the cultural patrimony of the country you're writing about is at risk from the pillage of archeological sites. I think both Rosemary and Mark has kind of really beautifully um, explain this to us, um, this kind of state of cultural heritage in both of these countries. And the risk of such destruction com sometimes comes from looting operations, from urban or rural development or infrastructure projects, like a dam building project, um, sometimes climate change and various disasters, such as earthquakes and wildfires, and of course, trafficking of antiquities. Um, step two is to share your knowledge and experience to illustrate what the country you're writing about is already doing 
to protect its um, archaeological heritage. Are there any new museums or cultural institutions to support heritage preservation or scientific research has been opened in Nepal and Honduras? Uh, Mark was telling us about the Department of uh, Archaeology, for example. Perhaps you may be aware of new legislation that's geared towards heritage preservation in that country. Any heritage processes or institutionalization that aligns well with heritage preservation goals or strategies would work well in this section. These may be very powerful points to raise. And finally, step three. Um, um, you can end your letter with expressing your support, very clear support to the uh, bilateral agreement, which is often is also referred to as the memorandum of understanding between two countries. Um, here, it may be very helpful to also point out how the memorandum of understanding will be of interest to the international community, will be of benefit to the international community to encourage the exchange of cultural materials making its rich assemblage available to uh, scientific communities in their publication, maybe through traveling exhibitions, but definitely focusing on archeological research being made possible um, and um, protecting these um, archeological sites from looting and, um, and illicit trafficking. Um, so, um, so that's that's about it. Um, please um, submit your letter via uh, the regulations.gov um, website. That's um, that's linked to um, on this page. But we will also provide uh, these links to you um, as well on the AIA website. Um, there, it's due on September twelfth at um, midnight. Um, and letters can be typed in the comment box or uploaded as a PDF. And um, you can see some of uh, some sample letters on AIA's website as well. Um, please look in the video description to find the URL um, when we post this video, recording of this video. We will provide that as, as well. So if you've experienced the heritage of Honduras and Nepal, we hope you'll use your voice and join us um, as we advocate for the future of cultural heritage in Honduras and Nepal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will um, stop sharing my screen. So um, we have a couple minutes. Um, we're almost out of time, but um, we have a couple of minutes to consider any questions we have um, from the audience. Um, so I see, uh, I see a question for Rosemary. Um, would you like to? Um, so from Alexander Whitaker. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I see. I see the question. I was just about to try and type something, but I'll say very quickly. Um, you're asking if uh, former thieves and grave robbers, and I wouldn't actually characterize the people who do this work, um, the primary excavators, as either thieves or grave robbers. They're peasants who in an agricultural economy in a poor country see um, very little hope for themselves. So two things that have happened that already have changed the way that local people relate to these things are first efforts by local museums and the Institute of Anthropology and History that have led to the formation of citizen groups, including near my dissertation site, um, that are uh, called Casas de Cultura, um, Houses of Culture. And they have actually been reporting sites endangered, primarily from construction and other accidental dis destruction. And the other thing that has helped is, and is still needed, is continuing development work to provide economic alternatives for people. But the primary thing we can do in the US is stop the market for, the market demand for these antiquities enjoy what's in museums, um, but uh, try to dissuade people from adding to private collections and even from collecting from modern museums. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, 
So um, well, I want to say thank you everyone for joining us for your lunchtime or your afternoon um, from all over the world. I, I saw that uh, we had um, audience members from, uh, from abroad as well. Um, thank you so much. And I wanna thank uh, both Rosemary and Mark for being with us today and sharing your incredible depth of knowledge about these countries, the archeology span of these countries, the cultural heritage of these countries. And to our audience members, please um, join our writing campaign. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope this will be a fabulous, sort of encouragement for you to, to raise your voice and support support our campaign. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Spell.